Inner peace, outer peace. From Timeless Healing, The Power and Biology of Belief by Herbert Benson, read by Vincent Bagnall. There's no question in my mind that no matter where self-care habits are taught in American society, they will foster a healthier, calmer, and more productive populace. But I worry about using these principles of science to bolster specific types of meditation or specific theologies. I believe that when it comes to garnering the full measure of remembered wellness with mental focusing techniques, the teacher should not impose views on the student. We need to be aware that appropriateness to the individual empowers these mechanisms within the body. Now, certainly science can find commonalities among people. For example, that we all respond to human touch, or that we often find rituals meaningful. But we cannot, for example, make aromatherapy work for someone who isn't inclined or wired to respond to it. There isn't one affirmation that will restructure everyone's thinking for the better. Nor will Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, be a very satisfying means of eliciting the relaxation response for, say, someone who's Jewish. As researchers learn more about emotion and its crucial contribution to brain function, we must keep in mind that we all still operate with different emotions and strengths of emotions. Our diversity makes us perceive pain differently, emotionally, and thus physically. We will never be wired to entertain the same beliefs or one particular faith. The relaxation response in the schools Many people could read the facts that I've presented here, the evidence that mind, body, and soul are mingled, and believe that a separation of church and state is therefore impossible and inappropriate. Again, I am a physician, and not a public policymaker. My position is to point out the win-win situations that are possible in health. For example, it is conceivable that children in public schools could be taught to elicit the physiologic benefits of the relaxation response and that the students who wanted to could apply their religious beliefs to evoke remembered wellness as well. The health benefits of which are proven and which I have identified as the faith factor. Schools could set aside a period of silence during which children could practice this habit some of them using a secular focus to elicit the relaxation response purely for its health benefits, some eliciting it with prayer, and still others declining to do it at all. Thus the health and self-esteem benefits could be promoted and people could exercise their beliefs in ways that are meaningful to them. But at the same time, it would run counter to the evidence I've gathered for diverse children and diverse people in a public setting to be taught that any one technique or any one set of beliefs would reap universal physical rewards. To enjoy the health benefits of remembered wellness, you have to heed your own instincts. Appreciating the unique set of life experiences and emotions contained in the neurosignatures of your brain the meaning you afford to your life, the healing trust you place in a caregiver, or the solace you grasp from a belief in an infinite absolute is uniquely powerful for you. As subjective as remembered wellness is, there are some definitive things I can say about incorporating healing beliefs and faith into your life. These are some of the principles and practical lessons I've drawn from my long medical quest for lasting truths. I hope they prove helpful. Number one, practice and apply self-care regularly. Work with your doctor and with unconventional practitioners, if you so choose, to learn self-care habits. The neglected leg of the three-legged stool. I consider self-care anything an individual can do, independent of doctors or healers, to enhance his or her health. This includes mind-body reactions, such as remembered wellness, the relaxation response, and the faith factor. 
It also embraces good nutrition, exercise, and other means of stress management. When you make self-care activities and commitments a locus of your life, you'll feel and you'll be healthier. I don't mean to make light of a difficult reality you face, but if you conceive more for yourself than you would normally, your mind-body will, to a certain extent, respond as if the ideal were possible. With this approach, seemingly unachievable events can be achieved. I use the term self-care because it puts the onus on you. It shifts the emphasis from your role as a passive patient to active participant, a shift that medicine has not always encouraged. However, as you will recall, I caution against becoming self-absorbed in self-care. Don't become fixated on your health or on the avoidance of aging, illness, or death. Make your daily elicitation of the relaxation response, your jog or your salad at lunch. If you don't have enough of these soul-nourishing pleasures in your life, or if you don't know where to begin, you'll find a magnitude of resources available to you in the library. Just remember to modify information according to your own belief system, your gut instincts, and the experiences unique to you. If they're marketed well, exercise videos, self-help books, spirituality lectures, religious retreats, get-rich schemes, and mind-body messages will play on your emotions, making you believe that you can't live without them or that your life will be changed overnight with their influence. Remember that change in our lives because of our wiring and conditioned responses is gradual and cumulative. So extract the gems or slivers of truth that your belief system advocates. Then let the other advice slide off your back. You are, after all, the authority on living your life. Since the vast majority of the medical complaints brought to doctors, offices are stress and belief related. You must learn to care for and heal yourself most of the time. Don't be alarmed by this prospect. Your body already does this day in, day out, and is astoundingly good at it. Again, it's almost always valuable to seek the assistance of your physician to determine the difference between a condition that will benefit from self-care exclusively and one that requires the other two legs of the stool, drugs or procedures to treat. Learning about your body and its ebb and flow is an evolutionary process. You'll work toward a more independent attitude, become acquainted with the warning signs of heart attacks, strokes, cancer, and other life-threatening diseases. Over time, you'll develop a sense of what symptoms are important, those that are extreme or don't go away. As I've said, I'm not suggesting that you become maniacally alert or preoccupied with every ache or pain. Sensible monitoring of bodily change is the key. When a woman is taught to examine her breasts in monthly self-exams, she learns that the most important thing to look for is change. Practicing self-exams, a woman comes to know her particular contours, tissue, and cycle so that she will recognize new sensations, indentations, or growths. This is a sage example for us in observing our overall health if you're accustomed and attuned to your body's normal, everyday function in which minor aches and pains are common, in which a stressful day is apt to bring on a headache or a certain food triggers digestion problems, you'll be better able to spot an unusual reaction. Respecting this maintenance routine inside of you, perhaps you'll be obliged to feed it more healthfully, to rest when you need to, to exercise this wonderful machine and support it, with a positive life outlook. How influential can a coordinated contingent of self-care habits be? We honestly don't know. But Dr. Dean Ornish, president of the Preventive Medicine Research Institute in Sausalito, California, found that heart disease could not only be relieved, but reversed when patients made significant changes in diet, 
exercise, and stress management. Our two programs will soon be compared in a groundbreaking research project sponsored by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission and the John Hancock Insurance Company. In this comparison, patients with heart disease will be divided between our two clinics in hopes that we can gauge the adherence to and results of various self-care components and other treatments. Exploration such as this will help medicine prescribe revolutionary change for itself, heightening the respect physicians have for patient-empowered healing. It would also be interesting to study Christian scientists who excuse all medical care except dentistry and bone setting. It would also be interesting to study Christian scientists who excuse all medical care except dentistry and bone setting. Does faith alone make them well? Is there something to learn from a community that relies on faith, not pills and procedures? Know your truth. Each of us possesses an awesome healing power. It takes your belief to imbue the caregiver and the treatment with the power of remembered wellness. So whenever you get medical advice, no matter what the source, hold fast to the scientifically proven power that you wield. You'll recall the story in which Antonia Baccaro, who had a previous scare with a precancerous condition, panicked after a Chinese healer with impaired judgment told her she didn't look well. In these situations, it's critical to remember that you are an authority on what will hurt or heal you. Don't let any physician or healer or fortune teller or card reader, preacher or teacher, magazine story or medical book, friend or lover, therapist or support group impress something untrue upon you. Truth, like scientific fact, is supposed to be unassailable. But the truth buried in minds, bodies, and souls, is often a cachet of meaning and joy far more substantial than the truth of a diagnosis, label, category, or statistic. Some of the most inspiring people I've ever met are those who, despite AIDS or diseases for which no cure is known, carry on with purposefulness and humor verve and compassion, not allowing their disease to overcome their souls. The Bible says that the truth will set us free. And often, when we find it deep within ourselves, it can. William James wrote, The philosophy which is important in each of us is not a technical matter. It is our more or less dumb sense of what life honestly and deeply means. It is only partly got from books. It is our individual way of just seeing and feeling the total push and pressure of the cosmos. People describe the process of finding out what is important to them, of tapping into their beliefs in very different ways, sometimes calling it soul-searching, mulling it over, listening to one's heart, going inside of oneself, praying or sleeping on it. Some people act on instincts or common sense. Others find a truth or intuition emerges slowly. But most people know when something feels right. Most people have a kind of internal radar that occasionally calls out to them. The next time you're faced with a major decision, medical or otherwise, ask yourself, what feels like the right thing to do? Or what should I do if the choice were entirely up to me? I'm not suggesting that you make decisions based on this factor alone, but at least let belief be a player. Honor your convictions and perceptions enough to make them a part of a hearty intellectual argument. Our conditioning from Descartes on has been to cordon off emotion from reason, fact from opinion, even though we now are learning that objectivity is subjective and that reason relies on emotion. To gear our beliefs and emotions to work for us, we have to listen to them more than typical Western and American upbringings have trained us to do. In his book on synesthesia, you'll recall that Dr. Kaitowik remarks that we all know more than we think we know. 
And because, as he says, emotion has a logic of its own and is so instrumental in assigning priorities of thoughts and impressions in our brains, we would be wise to start paying more attention to our emotions and beliefs. But in deciding between the Western world's view and our own internal view, he writes, the first step in breaking through to the transcendent is putting aside the idea that we have to choose between objective and subjective views of reality. Many aspects of human experience cannot be conveyed by objective facts, nor is there any escape from subjectivity. In addition to a detached objective view based on externals and a subjective view based on our inner life, there is a third choice grounded in experience through which noetic understanding is found. This is the depth at which we really live. Taking that third choice, you can mingle objective observations with emotions and gut reactions. If after hearing everything a surgeon has to say, the prospect of facial surgery and having half of your jaw removed to eliminate a tumor is more abhorrent to you than death, as it was for Barbara Dawson, you need not apologize for this conviction. If you've carefully weighed your options and decided you'd rather skip red meat and other animal products the rest of your life than have open-heart surgery, this is your right. And you'd be wise to practice your right after gathering all the information, surrounding yourself with physicians and caregivers you trust, and filtering the facts through the belief system you've acquired over a lifetime of your unique experiences. We'd all prefer there to be right and wrong answers, hard and fast information, and no-load, risk-free health care solutions. But no such clear-cut world exists. Health need not be pursued by hunches, but the most that any good doctor, together with an informed patient, can do is offer an educated guess or a best estimate. In developing this best estimate, we'd all be wise to listen to the body more often and to regard our beliefs with greater respect. Let your instincts guide you. Follow them up with research. Put your health in good, trustworthy hands. Let your health have time to correct itself. Invest remembered wellness and a reasonable application of self-care, medications, and surgery for maximum health returns. Let faith, the ultimate belief, heal you. St. Anselm, who was believed to have lived between 1033 and 1109, wrote, God is that the greater than which cannot be conceived. Belief in God and the ultimate conceivable greatness is the most influential form of remembered wellness. With death, a loathsome destiny, we cherish a better explanation of life. Whether we remember the peace of God because God wants us to, or we remember a life-transcending power because our evolution made it a requisite for survival, faith in a supreme being is a supreme physical healer. According to medical research, faith in God is good for us, and this benefit is not exclusive to one denomination or theology. You can believe in God in a quiet introspective way, or declare your convictions out loud to the world and still reap the physiologic rewards. For many reasons, religious activity and church-going is also healthy. Religious groups encourage all kinds of health-affirming activities, fellowship and socializing perhaps first among them, but also prayer, volunteerism, familiar rituals and music. Prayer in particular appears to be therapeutic, the specifics of which science will continue to explore. I find that sometimes people are reluctant to rely on faith to soothe them. They think religion is a crutch, and they don't like to think they need it. And I've heard others disparage the last-minute conversions that often occur in people who are seriously ill. But the truth of the matter is that faith is a natural and inevitable physiologic reaction to the threats to mortality that we all face. We cannot help but be drawn to it in an hour of need. In 2 Corinthians 12.9, the Apostle Paul describes the Lord's reply to his appeals for relief from a physical ailment, saying, My grace is all you need, for my power 
is strongest when you are weak. I believe that humans are wired for faith and that there is a special healing generated by people who rely on faith. So whether or not you believe in God per se, try to conceive of greatness beyond which there can be nothing greater. It is your destiny to believe in something good and something that lasts, but only you know what feels right for you. The pharmaceuticals and surgical procedures of modern medicine can do great things for you if your medical problems fall within their realms to heal. But much of the time, you have the power to heal yourself. And all of the time, you can enhance your health with remembered wellness. Nevertheless, we should not expect to develop a faith in remembered wellness overnight. We've all been conditioned to believe in various sources of healing, in pills or doctors, in exercise or chiropractors, in herbs or prayer. It is not my intent in this book to undermine the things you believe have helped you heal. No matter how conscious you become of the fact that remembered wellness healed you, therapies that rely on remembered wellness, such as herbs and acupuncture, retain a subliminal power. Even though we do not necessarily need all the pills and procedures that conventional medicine and unconventional medicine give us, these medicinal symbols retain an aura of effectiveness and often appease our desire for action. While we must learn to use medicine more appropriately for the conditions it can help and to wean ourselves from excessive spending on unnecessary therapies, we'll often need some catalysts for belief, even if belief is really the healer. So remember the vigor from the time you felt healthiest in your life. Remember the blessing your mother said to you before you left for school, the smell of incense at church, or the tranquility you felt picking up stones from the beach on Cape Cod. Remember the time the penicillin vanquished your ear infection or the time the surgeon removed the splinter from deep in your foot and your pain immediately ceased. Remember how full-throated you sang in the choir or how long you stayed on the dance floor of a nightclub. Remember the doctor who really cared about you or the chaplain who prayed with you in the hospital. Remember the way you felt when you made love to your husband or your wife and the way you felt when your daughter or son was born. Then let go and believe. You've read all about your physiology. You've surrounded yourself with good caregivers who help you take a moderate, balanced approach to your health and health care. Now it's time to enjoy your endowment. This wiring for faith that makes the power of remembered wellness so enduring. Believe in something good, if you can. Or even better, believe in something better than anything you can fathom. Because for us mortals... This is very profound medicine.